999 times out of a thousand, the timing of an election should be totally irrelevant to a court. It has nothing to do with the merits of the case. In this circumstance, however, the timing matters for a legal reason. And the legal reason is that if Donald Trump wins, he could end the case. When you prosecute politicians, typically, the politician doesn't have the ability to end the case. Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum. We range from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark, and I'm joined by two of our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, Damon Linker, who writes the Substack newsletter Notes from the Middle Ground, and sitting in for Linda Chavez this week is the Bulwark's own Kathy Young. Our special guest is New York Times columnist David French. Welcome, one and all. Well, we have more news than we can possibly digest this week, but let's jump in with the uh, news that broke yesterday, namely that the Supreme Court has decided to grant certiorari uh, regarding Trump's claim of immunity. Um, Just a little background here. Um, Jack Smith had... um, before the Court of Appeals took this case, Jack Smith had uh, applied for a writ of certiorari before judgment to the Supreme Court, asking that they um, expedite things by deciding this question of immunity um, uh, finally uh, and skip the Court of Appeals altogether. Supreme Court turned that aside. So it did indeed go to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals took its time and finally issued a wonderful ruling saying no, no, no presidential immunity. Beautiful ruling. David French, a lot of people were saying, okay, the Court of Appeals took its time, but now we know why. They were writing an opinion that was so airtight that it would be so easy for the Supreme Court to simply say, exactly. Cert denied. Let the Court of Appeals decision stand. They said everything that needs saying, and that's not what happened. So tell us what you think the court is up to here. Why did they delay two and a half weeks before granting cert? And why did they take it? Well, I think I can deal with the why did they take it pretty easily. Um, The reason why they took it is, number one, it is a novel and important legal issue applying to the president of the United States. Uh, I think the outcome is a foregone conclusion, but there had been no Supreme Court authority directly on this point. Uh, So they took it for that reason. And also there's another very practical reason why they took this case now. Basically, everyone wanted them to take it in the sense that Jack Smith had already asked them to take it, saying this is important enough for you to take. And then, of course, Trump wanted to appeal because he lost at the D.C. Circuit. So it would have been a very strange situation for the court to say, wait a minute, both sides here are wanting us to have have indicated that they want us to take this case. And it's a novel legal issue involving the president of the United States. I'm not at all surprised they took the case. The issue that is surprising to me or disappointing would be the better word would be the granting uh, continuing to stay. They didn't technically grant a stay, but they the case is still delayed pending the resolution. They didn't have to do that. They did not have to keep holding the case in abeyance while they decided this outcome. And so that's the thing that disappoints me. Now, for a lot of people who are white hot with rage at the court right now, the one caution I would add to that is, guys, the court was kind of put in this position by not bringing charges until much later in Biden's term. If the charges had been brought earlier, this kind of briefing schedule would be rightly viewed as expedited. It isn't actually an expedited schedule. Um, So that timing is not the court's fault. But I still believe they should not have stayed the case or not have permitted the case to be delayed. Um, Because, look, 999 times out of 1,000, the timing of an election should be totally irrelevant to a court. It has nothing to do with the merits of the case. In this circumstance, however, the timing matters for a legal reason. And the legal reason is that if Donald Trump wins, he could end the case. When you prosecute politicians, typically 
the politician doesn't have the ability to end the case. In this circumstance, if Donald Trump wins, he has the opportunity to end the case. Damon, um, <clears throat> David said everybody wanted them to take this case, but I think um, uh, Jack Smith notionally wanted them to take the case. I mean, he did want them to take the case earlier in the procedural posture. I think it's fair to say that in the current moment, he would have vastly preferred that they not take the case for the reasons that David just outlined, that the timing is critical here and that... Um, this this choice by the Supreme Court to get involved is not, you know, it's not without real world consequences in the sense that we're going to now Trump's um, strategy of running out the clock looks like it's going to succeed, at least on this case and probably on all of them, except maybe the New York uh, hush money case. Yeah, well, we're, we're dealing with a, with a kind of scheduling logistical nightmare here because, of course, it's not just that there's this huge case, which is very complex and is going to require, they're going to be, uh, you know, Trump's team is going to be raising objections to things left and right, and they're going to have, everything's going to have to be gone over by the judge. And so even if it were just this case, it would be tricky to get it all done with a verdict by election day. But then, of course, we're in this truly bizarre situation where Trump is also on trial in all these other cases. And they all have to get scheduled. And they're not going to have him on trial, uh, you know, in one court in Florida and another court in New York at the same time. They, they, have, to, they have to scatter them. They have to put them in some kind of an order. And in each case, Trump's lawyers are going to be raising objections all the time to try to delay it, which means you could get one scheduled and then another court case gets delayed, which means the second one has to get delayed. It's like that that phenomenon when they, they analyze how traffic jams happen and you see it from above and you see that what happens is the first car hits the brakes and then the next car hits the brakes and the next and the next and they all kind of pile up and before you know it one, one car changes lanes one time leads to a backup that delays everybody for a half hour. It, it's that sort of where we are, and it is a function, as David said, of the fact that that uh, w this all got delayed. That that you know January sixth happened. Biden is president. And nothing moves forward for all that time. And then finally, the attorney general appoints a special counsel who looks into it and then charges are handled. And then you also have the, 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 the really strangest case of all because it is so totally self-inflicted, the documents case, which, you know, when the Trump administration ended, nobody foresaw that as a potential legal jeopardy for the former president. And that got thrown into the mix with Jack Smith handling that as well. So it's a combination of a guy who is in like 18 legal difficulties at the same time in different jurisdictions. <laughs> with the fact that they're all coming ripe at exactly the same time with a deadline up ahead of the election. And it isn't, I mean, David's totally right, of course, that, uh, you know, there is the problem that Trump himself can end the trial the moment he becomes president if he wishes. But it's also the fact that it would be nice if the American people could decide who they're going to vote for on the basis of whether or not he's convicted for trying to overthrow the government the last time he held the office. And the idea that we could be like three weeks from a verdict, but oh well, it's too late. We got to vote now instead uh, is, is almost too awful to imagine that we're in the situation. But then again, I would use those words to describe so much about the Trump era in our politics. Yeah, that is... True enough. Okay, uh, before I get to Bill, I, uh, a quick uh, clarification on a legal matter, David. Um, <clears throat> so the Justice Department has a policy of not issuing indictments or appointing special pro counsel and so on too close to an election. But if a case is already in process, does the timing of that case, does that Justice Department uh, policy apply to a judge? Like would Chutkin have to say, well, I can't hold a trial in September because the Justice Department has a policy about this? No, the Justice Department policy doesn't govern the judges at all. Mm -hmm. So the judges mm -hmm. get to decide when the trial is. So okay. in theory, Judge Chutkin could say, no, we're holding this sucker in October, in theory. Okay. 
Um, however, you know, Trump would strenuously object to that and argue that prejudices him. He needs to be on the campaign trail, for example. He can't be in a courtroom for four to six weeks or however long. But the, just, the DOJ policy does not govern the federal judiciary. This is right. telling the prosecutors, if you're seeking a trial date, the sort of the unwritten rule is don't seek a trial date within 60 days of the election. Okay. Um, so, Bill, um, do you think that this is uh, a case of um, democracy being hamstrung by its own procedures? You know, that, that uh, go, um, Merrick Garland was so keen to reestablish norms and to say, you know, we're going to be super, super cautious about bringing a prosecution against a former president, and we want to be very, very careful. It would look bad. And Damon argued strenuously, actually, that they probably shouldn't do that, and, uh, for, but for prudential reasons. Um, but now that we see how this is unfolding with all of these manifold delays, and it looks like you know, that, that you know, these are the rules, and in a democracy you abide by the rules, but this could also be endangering the democracy. By, by abiding by the rules. What do you think? Catch-22? Uh, yep. Among many <laughs> other things that could be said about it. Uh, I'm coming away from all of this somewhere between mad at Merrick Garland and feeling sorry for him. Uh, because I think I can understand exactly what he was trying to do. And, of course, what he was trying to do was very consistent with his cautious and judicial temperament. You know, he not only wanted to reestablish the Justice Department as what he thinks it should be, or it should have been, uh, not only wanted to restore respect for the rule of law, but also, I think, as a judge, was genuinely and understandably cautious about moving too quickly. But that said, I don't think he's going to go down in history as a great or effective attorney general, you know, because he has dithered on many occasions, and on a few others he has rushed to judgment, or at least rushed to act, uh, in a way that I think was unwise, like, for example, in, you know, the question of parents attending school board meetings as potential, you know, terrorists or, or, or violent interrupters. Uh, I think that whole episode played very badly and actually contributed to inflaming the whole culture wars and schools issue. So I think what I'm discovering from all of this is that to be an effective Attorney General. On the one hand, you can't simply be an crony of the president, but on the other hand, you can't simply be a judge either. You know, there is a sweet spot of of temperament and of the balance between, you know, uh, judicial judgment on the one hand and the need to act with expedition on the other. And I'm afraid by those historical standards, he will be weighed and found wanting. Bottom line, it's not just a question of procedures, you know, that are part of democracy helping to undermine democracy. It's also a series of judgments made by a man in a position of authority that, frankly, I think have not, you know, stood the test of time. Kathy, um, so the other case that uh, we has sort of fallen out of public view to a large degree is the is the documents case, which is actually the most slam dunk of all of them in terms of, you know, evidence uh, of, of severe wrongdoing, uh, obstruction of clear obstruction of justice, uh, violating all kinds of very important um, criminal statutes about the handling of classified information. Um, and yet, uh, it's a measure of the corruption that Trump has introduced into our society that he appointed this judge, uh, Eileen Cannon, who, uh, without, without saying more than I know, because it's possible that she will turn out to handle this with, with great um, judiciousness, but she has given many indications that she's kind of on Trump's side and that she's going to just run out the clock for him. 
We'll know a lot more tomorrow. Um, but the reason I'm raising it is there is an aspect to this that, you know, in a, in a better world or, or maybe in the one we're li- living in, I'm not sure, the, uh, the question of presidential immunity is irrelevant to the documents case because right. it concerns activities that Trump engaged in not while he was president but when in his post-presidency. So this is a case against private citizen Donald Trump. Right. So what, what's your sense of things? Well, as you said, you know, we will know more tomorrow about the schedule of this case. Uh, I really do think that once it goes forward, it is a slam dunk. And I'm really glad, by the way, that uh, uh, Jack Smith made this statement that was very clear that there's no comparison with uh, the, the Biden issues, because, of course, that's been sort of the uh, the, the, the diversion <laughs> tactic, like, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, this is actually a both sides <clears throat> issue, and, uh, and now let's turn it into a question of whether Joe Biden has all his mental faculties intact, right? So it's like, you know, it's just totally delay and obfuscate, and, uh, and, you know, I was thinking as I was listening to you guys talk about the scheduling of this, uh, of the January 6th case, you know, in a better world, or at least in a sane world, you know, just the mere fact that we're talking about, you know, how many cases are there pending again, uh, you know, against this guy who is going to be the Republican nominee for president, and, you know, how many of those cases are going to go forward before the election, how do you juggle them all, and this wouldn't even, I mean, that alone, the fact that this guy who is running for president has so many cases against him pending right now that we can't even really keep them all straight and that it appears that his strategy really is just to run out the clock as much as he can. I mean, that itself, you would think, would decide the outcome because then, you know, you could just, I mean, the the argument would be, I mean, is this really the guy that you want in office? The guy who right now has, uh, you know, God knows how many pending cases against him, and you can't even really keep track of them unless you're a legal specialist. But obviously, that sane world is not the one we're living in. So, right. you know, and I think, uh, although, you know, I do think that it's going to have an impact. I do think that for a lot of people, the fact that this guy has all these cases against him and that if he gets elected, he may evade accountability simply by shutting down, or at least some of them, he may evade accountability simply by shutting down the legal process, because now he's the president and because he can. Um, I think that is going to have an impact on some voters. I think some voters who are maybe undecided on other issues, who may like some of what Trump did in his first term, you know, who may like some of what is saying, I think they are going to just pause and think, uh, if only because of the, you know, the chaos factor, (laughs) leaving aside the moral issues. So I think... Yeah, well, that's all, that's all we have now. impunity on that, I think. I think it is going to have an impact. So... Well... Voters we'll stopping see. and thinking is uh, is all we have now. But yeah. um, but one more. Say- well, well, Kathy, let me. Oh. I, I one more for uh, yeah. David, and that is. Um, so the Supreme Court felt this is an issue of first impression. Very important to get the Supreme Court on record about it. Okay, but and there are certain things that maybe you could see an argument for the Supreme Court clarifying. For example, what's the difference between. Uh, Barack Obama ordering the droning of Anwar al-Awlaki while he was president and the kinds of things that Trump did. So you could see that. But my question for you is, couldn't the Supreme Court have said, yeah, those are interesting issues and they can be uh, submitted after a verdict on an appeal? Why did they have to jump in now? Well, because this was a proper interlocutory appeal. In other words, that there's a very small category of appeals based on the idea that actually having to stand trial is the injury um, rather than that the conviction is the injury. In other mm-hmm. words, just having to stand trial is the injury. And there's a very small number of legal issues that are truly – truly subject to interlocutory appeals. And if this is one of them and this is one of them, then 
then the interlocutory appeal is proper, but that doesn't mean you have to stop the proceedings. Mm-hmm. That that's that's a separate issue. Now it's very common to stop the proceedings, but in this circumstance, you know, one of the there's this very tricky part of the Supreme Court opinion or the the little Supreme Court order. So it said it was granting Smith's Smith's request for to for a uh, uh, writ of certiorari, and it was denying as moot the stay. Now, why does that matter? Why did that little tweak matter? It mattered because to grant a stay, you have to find that there is a likelihood or a serious chance of prevailing on the merits. Prevailing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's little to no chance he's going to prevail on the merits. So a stay was off the table, really, if you're going to apply the elements. So instead, they went with the Jacks, the original Jacks, or they went with the Jack Smith cert request. And so this is all a little kind of tricky and procedural. But it's a way the court took the case without demonstrating in any way, shape, or form that it agreed with Trump's argument. Yeah, but it was, look, I mean, there's no question that they did him a real solid here, right? I mean, this is... The odds of a trial happening before the election are really, really low at this point, no question. But, you know, one thing I wonder is... You know, a lot of people are saying, well, this would have been the thing. This would have been a conviction here would have been the thing. I mean, he's been found responsible for sexual assault. He's been yep. fined hundreds of millions of dollars for fraud. We all yep. watch January 6th. I just, I'm just so skeptical of any argument that says, no, 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 this is the thing. <laughs> this yeah. is the thing. Except that so many voters are telling pollsters that if he was convicted of something, they wouldn't vote for him. But I don't know. They, but that's you, even that's, shifting too, Mona. There was it, some recent polling showing he still would beat Biden with a conviction. <laughs> okay. So. All right. Well, let us move on now to uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, who has announced his uh, that he is stepping down as majority leader, uh, minority leader, rather. Um. Really interesting reactions. Um, this one is probably the most uh, dismaying, disgusting. Uh, it was from the House Freedom Caucus. It's a tweet. Uh, as soon as the word came out, they said, our thoughts are with our Democrat colleagues in the Senate on the retirement of their co-majority leader, Mitch McConnell, D. Ukraine. No need to wait till November. Senate Republicans should immediately elect a Republican minority leader. Uh, So, Damon, um, the Mitch McConnell arguably spent his entire career dedicated to transforming the courts into, uh, you know, putting conservatives on the court and uh, and helping Republicans win races. And Republicans are now the ones celebrating his uh, his you know, his his retirement and Democrats uh, are rushing to embrace him on the floor of the uh, Senate after his after his speech. It's it's just uh, amazing. I, I I'm I'm actually going to defer to uh, Matt Iglesias, who had the, the most fabulous tweet yesterday about that House Freedom Caucus tweet tweet. Uh, this is what he had to, Matt Iglesias had to say. Another great example of Russian propaganda devouring the Republican Party. McConnell cuts taxes. He bans abortion. He opposes immigration. He opposes gun control. But he also opposes Russian conquest of Ukraine. So he's a rhino. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It's just, it's just too much. I just can't believe this. I mean, I mean, if there were a historic Senate leader on the Democratic side who had accomplished for the Democratic Party everything that Mitch McConnell has accomplished for the Republican Party, I think I saw someone say something like this uh, last night also online, that like, you'd be like naming Manhattan after him. Like, the, the, he would be a, a national hero for Democrats. And instead, you have this grumbling and kind of, oh, yeah, good riddance for this guy who I have no love for at all. And that's even aside from, 
you know, the the predictable ideological disagreements that I have, partisan disagreements, because I'm not a Republican, or at least I haven't been for a very long time. And I think he's done a lot of civic damage to the country with a lot of decisions he's made down through the years, but especially his the way he acted after January 6th and his blocking of what could conceivably, with some whipping, have actually been a conviction of Trump after the second impeachment, which could have gotten would have rescued us from our uh, purgatory we find ourselves in right now as Americans and instead he did what he always does which is side with his calcula his Machiavellian calculation of what will be better for the Republican Party which is the only thing he really cares about even as it transforms into something that he has, I think, uh, very sincere and very justified uh, reservations about. But he hasn't changed his tune uh, as a result of that shift. So uh, I, I don't know what else to say about him other than I am not going to support, uh, you know, naming bridges after the guy. Uh, but I think as, as an analyst of politics, I would say that here's someone who has had a tremendous impact on this country's uh, politics and to see uh, so many Republicans uh, responding to it as if, oh, we can't get rid of him fast enough so we can put someone more Trumpy in the position is, is you know, exactly what one would expect these days, I suppose. Um, yeah, the, David, there's that, that old line, I forget which uh, um, little duchy or whatever it was in Europe, but, you know, that we will astound the world with our ingratitude. Um, that's pretty much what um, what the Republican Party is doing uh, to Mitch McConnell, having, you know, he's been responsible for all of these conservative judges, which they're happy to give Trump credit for, but not McConnell, um, and so on. But um, I, I do think, uh, tell me what you think about this, that um, – his he he just never was able to recognize his his loyalty to the Republican Party and his aim of always getting Republicans elected, even came out for Herschel Walker. Right, um, you know he he just lost the the plot. He lost a sense of what you should be trying to achieve in public life. For him, it became he he got swallowed up by partisanship, blind partisanship at the end. And his party was changing under him, and he refused to grapple with that. He was not the man for this moment. Um, Mitch McConnell was a man for the moment until November of 2016. And then he mm -hmm. was not the man for that, the everything that followed. So before 2016, and even after 2016, McConnell still had a lot of strengths as a legislator, as a leader of the Senate. I mean, to understand, let's, let's put it this way. Republicans are going to quickly learn how effective Mitch McConnell was <laughs> when he's right. not there. Okay. Right. So he, he continued to be an extremely effective legislator and, and managed the Senate very effectively. But as far as understanding the import of the times, no. And you saw that most clearly in the aftermath of January 6th. And right. this is a situation where, you know, I, I tend to believe that if he had had the votes to impeach and convict, he would have voted to convict. But I got zero indication that convicting Trump was a priority for him at all. It was much more that he was waiting and seeing sort of where the party was. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really interesting. McConnell, McConnell has this extraordinarily low approval rating because the left dislikes him because he's effective. Right. And the far right hates him because they think he's ineffective. And it's, they're, both, they're not both true because the fact of the matter is Mitch McConnell has been a remarkably effective – at accomplishing his goals, legislative leader, and the far right that has always been after him has frequently been proven wrong in its assessments of where, of, of you know, it proven wrong in its defiance of McConnell. And this goes back to the Tea Party era, if not before. Yes. I remember Sharon Engel and Christine O'Donnell and all of these winnable Senate races that the, where they pushed through the establishment and they lost. Exactly. And, you know, if if people, more Republicans had listened to McConnell in some of these primary races, it would be a Republican Senate right now in all likelihood. Yeah. Um, 
But if you want the accurate assessment of Mitch McConnell's effectiveness, read the left. Don't read the right. <laughs> um, so, Kathy, uh, in addition, yes, he was the great foil uh, back in 2013 when Ted Cruz uh, was shutting down the government in order to um, in order to repeal Obamacare. Uh, you know, the, and you know, which was the sort of the original uh, pointless gesture. Uh, that has oh, yeah. now become de rigueur among Republicans, um, right. and McConnell, you know, had no patience for it at the time. And of course, uh, Cruz and and his acolytes demonized McConnell uh, for not being willing to go along with their performative nonsense. Um, but um, but so while one was inclined to think well of McConnell then, um, that January sixth. Uh, not the January sixth day, but the but right, the speech the that he gave right. the after the speech that he gave after voting to acquit uh, Trump was one of the most heartbreaking moments because he said everything that was true, and yet his actions didn't follow through. And maybe David's right. Maybe he couldn't have whipped nine more senators. I don't know. I think he never tried. That's my impression from people I talk with. And um, and that could have made all the difference. And it just I don't know. It, it for me that that soils his legacy completely. Yeah. No, I totally agree. But even before that, I really do think that the blocking of the Merrick Garland nomination for the Supreme oh yeah Court, that too. I think that did you know even uh, completely aside from the question of you know do you agree or do you not agree with various decisions that the court has made, you know, would Merrick yeah, that's not the point. a good no. Supreme Court justice. All of that aside, I think that really, really deepened the polarization and partisanship around the Supreme Court, which is really mm -hmm. the one institution that should be as, you know, shielded from partisanship as possible. It's never going to be completely shielded from it. But it really should have maximum non -part a maximum nonpartisan aura. And that was really difficult to maintain after the uh, blocking of the Merrick Garland nomination, which, you know, which he did very blatantly. And I mean, this the rule that he made up completely out of thin air that, you know, w when there was really a year left in Obama's tenure. And of course, they, they just errant hypocrisy with the Amy Coney Barrett when That's right. know, all of the people had been saying, well, you know, you wouldn't say that if the shoe was on the other foot. And he was like, Oh, yes, of course I would. I would absolutely apply the same principle. And then, of course, he splits some hairs and finds some reason why this is not the same. And, of course, that's always, I mean, when you're torturing logic for partisan reasons, it's always, oh, well, here's why it's not the same. So I think that really undermined the credibility of the court and... Uh, and I think that's really the first strike against him as far as his legacy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that his legacy ultimately, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy that he uh, sort of, you know, put, him, put his neck out for Ukraine, so to speak. And, you know, mm -hmm. he, now he's enduring this infantile sniping from the uh, so-called Freedom Caucus, which is really the, you know... Unfreedom the, the Caucus. The Unfreedom yeah. Caucus, at least for Ukraine. Um, but leaving that aside, you know, yeah, I do appreciate that he's sort of tried to be the adult in the room on that issue. But, you know, ultimately, if you're going to ask, you know, what is his legacy going to be? I think it's going to be the tarnishing of the Supreme Court with uh, you know, far more partisanship than there had been before and the, the uh, you know, serious damage to the court's credibility. And, of course, the utter fiasco of the uh, second impeachment and the fact yeah. that right now we're apparently going to have a guy on the ballot and possibly the next president who tried to overthrow the government, which is right. boggling, really, if you think about yeah. it. But here, there we are. So, Bill, um, the, the battles over the Supreme Court go way back. Um, I, I think Democrats have a lot to answer for in terms of politicizing the Supreme Court. I uh, was a freshly minted columnist when the fight over uh, Robert Bork was was taking place. Um, that was ugly and um, and set the tone, I think, for a lot that came 
afterwards. That much having been said, I do agree uh, with Kathy that the uh, the sort of it was jumping the shark to deny Merrick Garland a, a hearing uh, for an entire year, and then of course completely flipping when it came time to replace. Uh, Justice Ginsburg and putting rushing Amy Coney Barrett right onto the bench. Okay. Um, so anything that you want to comment there on uh, McConnell? I know you were very happy about his position on Ukraine, and that voice is now going to go silent. Um, and then I would like you to just say a word or two, if, uh, if we have time, yeah, we do have time, um, about the Insurrection Act, because both you and David have written about this, and uh, I want to, I want to just get that in here before we uh, before we move on. Well, sure, and I hope David gets an Orion, too, if there's time. Absolutely. Uh, because he, you know, he broke some ice with his piece, and that created some clear water for me to sail in behind him. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm interested in McConnell's departure for two reasons in addition to the ones that have been stated. First of all, I think that Freedom Caucus tweet uh, revealed just how symbolically and emotionally deep the Ukraine issue has now penetrated into the heart of the Republican Party. Uh, and, you know, that note, I think, explains, you know, in, in substantial measure why Speaker Johnson, you know, has had such a hard time moving forward. I hope you'll find a way. I've been writing about that. I have to say my op my optimism is waning. Point number two about McConnell. Uh, if if you look at the the three Johns who are lined up as the as the alleged front runners, the one you know, uh, the the one who commandeers the lion's share of the anti McConnell vote is going to be the winner, in my opinion. You know. Uh, you know, who and can it may get, not be any of those three. It may not be any of those three, but if it's not, it'll be someone even more unlike McConnell than any of right. those three. So, you know, so, but I think, I think the competition, you know, for the Hollies and the Vances and the others among the three alleged front runners is not going to be pretty and can lead to no good end. Yeah. Uh, Bill, um, you, before we, you start on the Insurrection yeah. Act, can I, if you're finished with that, but... Can I just ask you to frame it up this way? Because um, both you and David make excellent points about the need to reform it. But before you get to the merits, what is the, what are the chances that this Republican-led House is going to let any reform of the Insurrection Act out, of, out the door? I can't even understand my own party, let alone the <laughs> other party. So I'm going to let David speculate on okay. that. Obviously... You know, obviously, it would be a minor miracle if it happened, uh, but you know, a boy can hope, can't he? Uh, look, it, you know, it would be, you know, it would be an uphill uphill climb. On the other hand, I was not optimistic until it began happening that the two parties would be able to get together on the revision of the Electoral Count Act, which was a direct rebuke to Donald Trump. Yeah, but the Democrats were in charge of the House then. Yeah, look, uh, you know, I think uh, I think that we may see a much more active discussion of the discharge petition and other ways around the speakers and the rule com rules committee's blockade in the next few months, and we'll see. But the fact that the fact that these devices haven't been used successfully for a long time doesn't mean they can't be used successfully now. So we'll see. Okay. Uh, you know, on the you know, on the Insurrection Act, ironically so named, I must say, <laughs> uh, you know, this is this is a law that goes back almost to the beginning of the Republic. You know, it's an amalgam of, you know, of pieces of legislation enacted from the 1790s all the way up to the 1870s. Uh, and, you know, to cut to the chase... It gives the President of the, of the United States multiple venues and vehicles for deploying the U.S. military for domestic purposes without the consent of local authorities 
without any restraints that are legislated on what counts as an adequate justification for doing, for doing that, without any limits or, or, or sunshine features to these laws so that once the military is deployed, it's at the president's sole discretion when, it, when the deployment will end, if ever. Uh, you know, it is misused a vehicle for the imposition of martial law on different parts of the United States. Though there is no, there is no legal provision for martial law anywhere in the U.S. laws, but this would be the martial law that dare not speak, speak its name. Uh, and so, to be technical about it, it scares the expletive deleted out of me. Uh, <laughs> I could say a lot more, but I'd like to turn it over to David, who's, you know, whose piece was outstanding. Yeah. Um, and uh, wasn't David, remind me, there was a member of Congress who said, he, who was in on the idea of invoking martial law uh, after the 2020 election and only regretted that he had misspelled it as M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L. -L. I forget who did that, but I... <laughs> Probably Roger I Remember that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so it's not as if this hasn't crossed the mind of Trump and uh, Michael Flynn and other, you know, people in his circle, in his orbit, that they would like this kind of power. And as you point out, he actually would have it. Yeah, the, the really important part of the Insurrection Act is uh, this provision that says that and the, here's the key language. Whenever the president considers that unlawful obstructions, combinations, or assemblages or rebellion against the authority of the United States make it impracticable to enforce the laws of the United States in any state by ordinary course of judicial proceedings, he can call out the National Guard or the regular army. And the key words there are whenever the president considers. That is an extremely broad grant of authority. And what's interesting, Mona, is if you look through the U.S. Code, you will find there, there are hidden within there a number of sort of poison pills of huge grants of presidential authority um, that some of them are legacies of the Cold War, where there was really kind of never a thought that you could have such f incredible corruption in the office of the presidency as we've had recently. But there was a concern that the commander in chief would need to act with alacrity in the case of national emergencies and things right. like this. And so... There was a lot of trust placed in the chief executive statutorily, not just the Insurrection Act. And, and as Bill said, the Insurrection Act in some form goes way back to the 18th century. Um, but as a general matter, we have a lot of provisions and a surprising number of provisions in the code that give the president a lot of authority. But none is more dangerous than this. None is more dangerous than this because absolutely right. you absolutely – he absolutely has the power to call out the 101st – Airborne Air Assault Division, 82nd Airborne, whenever he considers it necessary. And we already know that there are plans drawn up to invoke the Insurrection Act on day one, on day one. And part of it has been designed to perhaps suppress demonstrations in cities. Another part of it is designed to, quote unquote, secure the border. But the Insurrection Act can't trump U.S. immigration law. So how is that going to happen? So it, it's a... It's a very fraught issue. And then the last thing that makes it even more difficult is because of those key words, whenever the president considers, there's a very good chance that what will happen is the Supreme Court, if any given invocation of this Insurrection Act is challenged, will just wash its hands and say, look, the law says whenever the president considers, if you want to limit the president, change the law. Okay. Uh on that grim note, let me uh, have a word here about Factor. <laughs> Factor is delicious, ready-to-eat meals that are delivered straight to your door. So whenever you are ready, whenever you don't have the time to shop or to cook, you can have pre-prepared Dietitian approved meals delivered to your door with over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan, and veggie. And there's even more. They, they will tailor it to your tastes. 
55 nutrition-packed add-ons can help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. So what are you waiting for? You can get started today and have a feel-good week of meals all ready to go. They also have snacks, smoothies, and more. Discover a wide variety of easy options for an entire day like breakfast, midday bites, and more. You can sign up and save. We have done the math. And Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. It is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale options done easily. There's no prep, no mess, meals. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat, so there's no prepping, cooking, or cleanup. So, how can you do this? You can head to factormeals.com slash beg to differ 50 and use code beg to differ 50 to get 50% off. That's code beg to differ 50 at factormeals.com slash beg to differ 50 to get 50% off. And we thank them for sponsoring this podcast. All right. Um, We have also seen in the past week a court in Alabama, Supreme Court of Alabama, um, ruled that um, its wrongful death statute did not contain a carve-out for um, uh, frozen embryos, and therefore um, a case, a wrongful death action by the parents of uh, some uh, embryos that had been destroyed accidentally, uh, that they, that yes, they could bring a case. And this was mislabeled a lot in the press as, as uh, the Supreme Court enacting a ban on IVF, which wasn't exactly right. It, it was not a ban, but the practical effect when you say that there is no carve out uh, and that uh, a you know, fertilized egg is uh, a, an unborn child or an extra uterine child, as I think the court decision phrased it, um, it did, uh, it did amount to a ban in the state of Alabama, and the the legislature is going to have to deal with that. But the reason I bring all this up is not because we're going to discuss IVF, but because it is interesting that the concurrence that was written by a judge uh, named Parker, what was his first name? Um, I don't have it here, but anyway, the Judge Parker, uh, Justice Parker said, it, he, there was a lot of God talk in this decision, a lot, including this line that really jumped out at me. Human life cannot be wrongfully destroyed without incurring the wrath of a holy God who views the destruction of his image as an affront to himself. Um, now, that's not the kind of language you usually see in judicial opinions. And... Um, I looked him up, and he is apparently a Christian nationalist. David, you have written uh, about Christian nationalism, and I gather you... Well, I know that you are mentioned in uh, Tim Alberta's recent book. Tim Alberta was a guest on our podcast. We discussed this at length. Um, And and you've written about this, and you... So you wanted to, um, before getting to the heart of what Christian nationalism is all about... You were at pains to say what it is not. So why don't you start there? Yeah. So there's a lot of, I mean, conversation about Christian nationalism, and it really blew up after January 6th because we saw Christian flags there. There was Christian music being played. There was prayers on the floor of of the Senate with, with, uh, you know, the insurrectionists having burst through. They prayed. There was just, it was before the insurrection, there were things like Jericho March where extremist Christian nationalist rhetoric was used. And so David, there is a real Can I interrupt real, real quick sure. to just say there were there were also they were also blowing shofars. Blowing As a shofars. Jew, I noticed this and yeah. I have to say this is cultural appropriation and I'm <laughs> offended. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, proceed. Yeah. <laughs> shofars are very common in Pentecostal Christianity now, but the <laughs> the uh, so anyway, huge conversations about Christian nationalism and a lot of it is misguided, because there are some folks, mainly on the left, who would say, well, if you're pro-life, you're a Christian nationalist. No, 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 no. The definition of Christian nationalism is not being a Christian who brings their values into the public square. Uh, if, if that was out of bounds, well, then Martin Luther King was in trouble because he's a Baptist minister 
engaging in a, it wasn't exclusively Christian, but look, the civil rights movement was pervasively Christian. It was not mm-hmm. exclusively, but it was pervasively. Abolitionism was pervasively a Christian music, a movement, not exclusively. And so do we want, we want those, we want religious perspectives in the public square, but what we don't want is Christian supremacism. In other words, putting Christianity as first amongst American religions. That is what we don't want. And that can be done in a couple of ways. One is ideologically, in other words, to say that, in essence, tying as a matter of formal ideology and theology, the fate of the church to the fate of the nation. And the other one is can be done through identity politics. In other words, Christians should rule. In other words, Christians... So one version of Christian nationalism is Christianity is the super identity and the super theology. Another version of Christian nationalism is that Christians are the super citizens, that they are the ones Mm -hmm. who are supposed to rule. And that's where Justice Parker from Alabama comes in. He's a, it appears he's a seven mountain dominionist, which that's a particularly virulent and dangerous form of Christian nationalism, which essentially holds that Christians are supposed to rule the seven, quote, mountains of culture, whether it's media, academia, government, the family, commerce, all of those areas are supposed to be ruled by, quote, unquote, mountain kings, which are supposed to be Christian. And so this really is Christian supremacism. And that is something that's antithetical to our constitutional experiment. It's something that's antithetical to our liberal democracy. And by the way, it's also something that's dreadful for the church itself, just dreadful for the church, because it completely defies the New Testament model of Christianity. And so it's bad for America, it's bad for our constitution, and it's bad for the church, and yet and millions of American citizens have been kind of swept up into it. Damon, it's um, maybe it's not ironic. Maybe there's a causal element here. But um, as church attendance is dropping, as as affiliation is dropping, um, extremism is rising. Um, something like ten percent of Americans now say that they agree with Christian nationalism. Not sure they necessarily know what it is, but maybe they do. Yeah, I sometimes think nobody really knows what it is, maybe except for David French. But, <laughs> like, you know, it's, when I see journalists banding about the term, I often kind of cringe and wince a little bit because I, I think it's used largely in polemical senses uh, instead of kind of precise terminological definition. But I think you're right that on the one hand, the people, as, as church attendance drops and kind of regular participation – in Christian communities in the world decline, first of all, those who remain tend to be kind of the the purer rump of the true believers. So they tend to be a little bit more extreme or at least the the center of the, uh, you know, the, the, the middle of the bell curve is drifting further in that extreme. So the people who remain are, are more uh, politically radical. But there's also the, this shift. I like David's distinction between ideological and identity-based Christian nationalism because what we are living through, especially since the rise of Trump, is, is this replacement of the kind of i i would say like some t- occasional christian nationalism that i was a critic of like 20 years ago when i wrote my first book the theocons um that was about i thought uh, at the time, uh, signs of Christian nationalism among some intellectuals who are supporting the Bush administration. Um, but what we see now is, I think, a more dangerous form of identity-based Christian nationalism in which people who think of themselves in, as Christians and yet don't really read the Bible, don't really go to church, don't really participate in any actual concrete Christian community in the world where people you know, engage in charity in the name of their faith and and also political engagement and think in terms of public policy following from their Christian convictions. They instead merely define themselves as Christian. Why? Well, because I'm a 
I'm a Trump supporter. I'm a, a diehard Republican and I vote mm-hmm. for these things and I check off boxes in this list of issues that people who are Republicans under Trump are supposed to believe. And that makes me a Christian. Um, and that is a kind of total reversal of, I think, what David's right in calling the defensible uh version of bringing your faith into the public square. I think like the the metaphor the metaphor I used to use 20 years ago when I was a critic of a lot of these trends uh, in indeed the more benign forms that they manifested themselves then um, was that you know it's perfectly legitimate for devout Christians to say I want a seat at the table and we should make room for them at that uh, as a seat at that table that's how I ended up working at first things in the first place is because I believed that it's very different to say and now that we're sitting at the table we're going to run the show at this table we are in charge of this table this is our table and we can decide if the rest of you even get a seat at all and that's what the more virulent form of Christian nationalism we see now I think is is really in danger of pushing into that kind of an idea. And that judge, uh, with his convictions, I think is firmly in that direction. And it's, it's pretty scary. Kathy Young, um, adjacent to or possibly part of this same phenomenon is this worship of um, certain figures, foreign figures like Putin and Orban, that these people see as being avatars of a muscular Christianity. Uh, they believe they've told themselves that Putin somehow is, you know, all for the Christian way of life and so on. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I was uh, actually. It's funny because I didn't know that you were going to ask me that question. But sitting here listening to Damon just now, I was thinking that the Christian nationalism that he's describing. In America, you know, these Christian nationalists who don't actually read the Bible or go to church, but, you know, they want a strong Christian hand, you know, running the state. I was thinking, boy, that really sounds like the Russian version of Christian nationalism because a number of people, and I actually wrote a piece about this for reason in like 2012. Uh, it was called Putin Goes to Church. Uh, and it, it, even then, it, a lot of people were commenting that there was this weird form of Orthodox Christianity uh, forming or had formed already by that time in uh, in Russia, uh, where you know a huge majority of the population supposedly identifies as Orthodox Christian. They will tell you, I don't know what the exact number is, but I think a majority now say that you need to be a, an Orthodox Christian to be a good Russian citizen. Uh, which is interesting because, you know, Russia does have a large Muslim population. And the, uh, anyway, but... Uh, and what, they also don't go to church very yeah, much, do the they? Thing. And you also yeah. have polls where the, these people, you know, like maybe 5% of them regularly attend church. Uh, a very, very small number pray on a regular basis. A lot of them will actually say that they don't necessarily believe in God. Like you, when you ask them, do, do, are, are you convinced that God exists. Like, a lot of them, I think more than half, will say no. So these are people for whom Christianity, Orthodox Christianity in that case, is a form of identity. And uh, I came across a really fascinating quote from a guy who was saying, a pro-Putin guy, um, I think a political strategist or something, who was saying this in a positive way, that, you know, just as in Soviet days, you had to be, you know, to profess to be a good communist. Communist, you know, in order to be a good Soviet citizen, now you need to be an Orthodox Christian, again, you know, in name only, really, uh, to be a good Russian. And I think it's very much like that. You see a situation in Russia where the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, um, Patriarch Kirill, is uh, one of Putin's cronies, and you know he's he has justified the war in Ukraine on all sorts of, you know, really spurious um, arguments. He's uh, justified the persecution of dissidents. He has said at various times that good Christians don't go to protests, etc. So you really have this sort of uh, symbiosis uh, between church and state. One in which, by the way, the church is very clearly subservient to the state. So. Right. 
and, and I think, uh, again, as I was listening to Damon, I was thinking, you know, that sounds really familiar. And, and I think that may be one of the reasons that a lot of uh, uh, Trump supporters feel a kind of affinity for Putin, because they really yeah. do see him. I mean, they also see him as the sort of anti-woke, <laughs> you know, uh, stalwart who is defending traditional values and so on. And, and I, th- there are just so many areas in which you could look and say, wait a minute, you know, Russia is really not a very traditionalist society. Uh, I mean, they, they, they've been trying recently to sort of curb abortion, but I think Russia still has one of the highest abortion rates in um, uh, in Europe and uh, all sorts of other... Uh, and, you know, again, if you start looking at polls where uh, it, it's really fascinating where a lot of these, you know, Russian Christians will say that, you know, being gay is absolutely unacceptable, but extramarital affairs, eh, you know, they're really kind of fine. You know, they're not so bad. So it's it's really very much about identity and, and yeah. this notion of... Thank uh, you. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, Bill. Uh, I think um, the group you're affiliated with, the Public Religion Research Institute, uh, did some survey work on uh, Christian nationalism and uh, found that Republicans are twice as likely as independents. So 55% of Republicans, uh, 25% of independents, uh, and only 16% of Democrats hold uh, Christian nationalist views. Um, but um, but you know, we still have seven out of ten Americans saying they're either skeptical of these uh, worldviews or, or reject these worldviews. Um, and yet it doesn't take that many uh, to affect American politics, especially when our primaries are structured the way they are to give a outsized voice to um, the most extreme people. I was struck by Damon's comment uh, that the phrase Christian nationalism is usually used rhetorically or polemically without any clear definition. Uh, the, the group that you just referred to, the Public Religion Research Institute, has now done two surveys in the past year, which have used a very clear and strict definition of Christian nationalist, nationalism with the five components. And component one is that the U.S. government should declare America a Christian nation. And there are a few others. And then component five is dominionist, straight out. God has called Christians to exercise dominion over all areas of American society. And by the strict definition of Christian nationalism that includes those two components, about 10% of Americans qualify as Christian nationalists, which is 35 million people. Uh, PRI, I could go on because it's a fascinating, the first study that was released in February of last year was fascinating. I was there for the release. Uh, But they've just put out another one breaking down support for Christian nationalism by state. That report just came out yesterday. And there are a number of states, when you look at that report, where a clear majority of white Americans meet the criteria of Christian nationalism. So this is not a fringe phenomenon. Uh, It's not a majority. But it's a big enough minority to have an effect, particularly, as you point out, when the set of relevant political actors is not a microcosm of the American population, but rather is a very distinct, small set of passionate voters who will act when others hang back. David, I just want to toss one more thing your direction, because when we were talking with Tim Alberta, um, he said, uh, you know, that there is this tendency that uh, is very evident in evangelical churches where they've elevated, they've kind of started worshiping America and Republicanism over God. (laughs) And, you know, you, as an outsider, I would say, doesn't that seem sacrilegious? 
But I you guess know, if you're not that serious a Christian in the first place, maybe it doesn't strike you that way. I don't know. What do you think? Well, you know, we've always had that strain in American life. There's a really interesting book written about the Spanish-American War, for example, talking about the religious elements of the Spanish-American War. There were, you know, the battle hymn of the Republic, for example, is an example of syncretism. You've got your patriotism and your religiosity combined in that song. Um, there's a long strain of that in American history, this sort of shining city on a hill that we have a special kind of divine providence. purpose, mm-hmm. divine providence. There's a lot of that there. And then it really, Mona, got put on steroids during the Cold War. Because remember, the Cold War had this element that the Soviet Union wasn't just a, a totalitarian empire. It was an atheistic right. totalitarian empire. And so this is when you began to see In God We Trust getting into you know, that's the national motto. The Pledge of mm-hmm. Allegiance is altered to include under God. And it's mm-hmm. showing this distinction. And so for decade after decade after decade, patriotism was very much mixed with Christianity in a way that was in, in many ways designed to distinguish our nation from the Soviet Union. Right. And I think that, you know, our emphasis should have been on religious freedom a nation of religious freedom versus a totalitarian empire, not Christianity versus atheism. Yeah. Um, and so we, we are a nation of religious freedom, but it still continues to this day where you have the American flag right on the church, in the stage, in the church sanctuary, right next to the pulpit sometimes. You'll have these Faith and Freedom Sundays where churches are surrounded by American flags. You'll see this where I live quite you know, commonly. And it's just culturally ingrained, especially in Southern churches, to a degree that a lot of people don't appreciate. And I've, I've, you know, I think it's deep roots historically, but then really doubled down during the Cold War. And right now, I think we're in a transition period where that sort of Cold War American Christianity is really not a match for the current times and our current challenges. And as evidence is what Kathy was talking about, one of our biggest challenges geopolitically comes from a Christian nationalist, Mm -hmm. comes from Vladimir Putin, who is melding together church and state in a way that's, you know, that's utterly incompatible with our constitution. And that's our, one of our main geopolitical competitors right now. So it's that there are historical roots for it, but for the good of the church and the good of the country, we have to disentangle the church and that we have to disentangle that close identity that the church has with the nation. Bill, did you want to just add something? Just very quickly, uh, David mentioned the battle hymn of the Republic. Let me read you the final lyrics of the battle hymn of the Republic. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free, while God is marching on. So we civil warriors, you know, are acting as Christ for the nation. You know, we are prepared to sacrifice for the nation the way Christ sacrificed for humanity. It's hard to get more interpenetrated and intertwined than that, Uh and, uh, you know, and this was the song that everybody sang. It was the song that, you know, for so many soldiers, not the Gettysburg Address, it was the Battle Hymn of the Republic that defined the struggle. Yeah. Um, there, there are, the, the historical roots are very deep, and that's a great point. Um, I do, though, think something has changed more recently because, David, I do think that during the Cold War, Yes, it was it was the capitalist religious West versus the godless communists, but there was also a tremendous emphasis on freedom of religion that we yes. had it and they didn't, and uh, that we were free to worship God or not, depending on our inclinations, and they were not, and so on, and um, and there was a lot of emphasis on that. So uh, something has been has been lost there. A lot has been lost. Well, um, you know, but, we, I think we largely got the Cold War. I mean, uh, 
obviously, you know, we were on the right side of the Cold War, and also we largely got the Cold War rhetoric right as freedom versus tyranny. But Mm -hmm. it's important to know that that was not necessarily always the message in American churches of freedom versus tyranny. It was sometimes Christianity versus communism. Now, I do think that Christianity is obviously incompatible with atheistic communism, (laughs) Uh, that And there is a deep conflict between Christianity and atheistic communism. But the Cold War at its heart was not Christianity versus communism, although a number of American Christians saw it that way. But I, I agree with you. I think there's this really interesting thing, though, about the rise of Trump that gives fundamentalist Christian nationalists, ironically enough, given that Trump is totally secular, yeah. that he's so devoid of ideology— and yet at the same time so willing to use power that he is a unique figure for a Christian nationalist because they can supply him with the ideology. They can supply him with sort of the, this is how you use power. And therefore, in a weird way, have more opportunity to gain power and authority under a Trump administration than any other Republican because other Republicans— with the possible exception of you know Ron DeSantis at his worst, they have an actual more holistic conservative ideological view with a strong and more value willingness to play by the rules and a more willingness to play by the rules. Yeah, yeah, excellent. All right, we will now turn to our highlights or lowlights of the week, and our producer asks us to be brief. So, uh, with that, I will start with Damon Linker. Okay, thanks. Um, All I want to do is offer uh, listeners a a couple of pieces they might want to read on the whole Trump immunity case. Um, There is a lot of severe criticism out there of the court for taking this on and and I, I'm with a lot of people on the foot dragging aspect of it, the kind of way in which they took the maximum amount of time to make the decision and, and then, you know, that they're not rushing it. It's, this is not Bush v. Gore, you know, being crashed through in a couple of days. Um, but there are really, as David mentioned, I think very nicely early on on the pod, uh, some very nice, very serious legal issues at stake here, and I'd recommend two pieces by Jack Goldsmith in Lawfare, one from February 6th titled Why the Supreme Court Should Grant Cert in United States v. Trump, and then another one from February 14th, The Consequences of Jack Smith's Rush to Trial. Um, these are, I think, really ideal pieces that uh, both set up the, the legal issues, the complex legal issues, and try to kind of uh, – it, it ends up um, kind of splitting the difference between a lot of the critics on the different sides in a way that's very thoughtful. So I think listeners might uh, get something out of them. Thank you. Kathy? So, yeah, um, I, I actually have a highlight and a low light, but they're going to be real quick and they're related. So the highlight is uh, just the incredible performance of Yulia Navalny, who is the widow of – Alexei Navalny, the murdered opposition leader. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw her speech to the uh, European Parliament yesterday. It was amazing. This is an incredibly strong woman who really does seem prepared to, you know, pick up the uh, mantle of leadership, so to speak, and really, really has the moral authority to do it and the personality. The low light is related because, I mean, the way that the Putin administration, well, the Putin gov, the Putin regime has been uh, just, you know, trying to disrupt uh, the funeral, the, 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 you know, a lot of the like, funeral homes are refusing to, uh, you know, give, uh, give space for the farewell, and now they can't find a hearse that would take the body uh, from the morgue to the church where they're going to have the funeral mass, and it's really quite obvious that, you know, they're, they're, they've been given instructions to uh, really disrupt this as much as possible, and it's just, I mean, the obscenity is so blatantly on display that it's, uh, it's just incredible. So, yeah, it's a highlight and a low light at the same time. Thank you. And another illustration of what happens when church and state are completely oh, yeah. uh, intertwined. David French. Um, I'm going to go a lot lighter than that because okay. I'm going with the highlight of the week, which I'll just say it first because we're all thinking it, Dune 2. Um, 
I'm going Friday night tomorrow. I'm going Friday night IMAX row three <laughs> middle. So I'm going to be completely encompassed by the Arrakis, the desert planet. <laughs> and if that's at all intimidating, I'm going to remind myself, as the Benny Gesserit do, that fear is the mind killer. And I'm just going to dive in. I'm going to dive into what, to what Adrian Villeneuve has for us. And I have no doubt it's going to be the most <laughs> epic, epicness that I've experienced in the theaters in a long time. <laughs> Excellent. Bill, I'm sure you're running out to see Dune 2 also, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid. I'm the yang to David's yin on this one. <laughs> you nailed it, Mona. <laughs> I think that's the I think that's the experience I'm least likely to have in the next week. But moving right on, you know, I have a highlight, which I rarely do. I think I have probably read twenty Paul Krugman columns where this Nobel Prize winning economist is scratching ahead trying to figure out why ignorant Americans don't realize how good the economy is. Uh, as a conclusive repost, you know, to those 20 exercises, I recommend in Thursday's Washington Post an opinion piece by Heather Long entitled Experts Boast About a Strong Economy, Why Doesn't It Feel That Way? Question mark. Here are some selected outtakes very briefly. Average hourly earnings up 15.4%. That sounds good. Unfortunately, CPI during the same period went up 18%. Uh, rent went up 20%. Used cars up 20%. Restaurants up 21, groceries up 21, airfares up 24, electricity up 28, gas up 35, eggs up 37, and motor vehicle insurance up 44. Aside from that, happy days are here again. And that was a highlight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, where's the you know, low light? <laughs> uh, look, you know, Anybody who can refute 20 Paul Krugman columns in 500 <laughs> words and a list of 20 statistics, that for me is my highlight of the day, if not the okay. week, if not the month. Moving right along. <laughs> All right. Well, I also have a highlight, um, which is um, Stephen Richer, who is the Maricopa County recorder, who has been uh, very courageous in standing up for truth in the state of Arizona and about the uh, uh, voting uh, issues, and who I had the pleasure of meeting over the weekend. Um, he had a great response to somebody on Twitter, uh, X. Um, this, uh, parent, this voter posted, Maricopa County at its finest, my first time ever voting in a presidential preference election, and I received not one, but two mail-in ballots. Thank you, at Stephen Richer. He wrote back, Hi, Aubrey. Thanks for reaching out. You changed your voter registration on the last day from your Chandler address to your new Tempe address. Because early ballots must go out on February 21st, your Chandler ballot was already set to go, and so it did. Then we sent out a new ballot to your Tempe address, which we processed your voter when we processed your voter registration modification. That's why you had to redact out different lengths in the address because they were sent to different addresses. And he goes through the, and then he says, as, so you'll notice that one of the packet codes ends in 01, the one to your old address, and one ends in 02, the one sent to your new address. As soon as the 02 one goes out, the 01 packet is dead, meaning even if you sent it back, it wouldn't proceed to signature verification and it wouldn't be opened. That's how we prevent people from voting twice. So, just use the one with your new address, ending in 02. That's the only one that will work. Hope this helps. Have a great night. Happy voting. As the kids say, owned. <laughs> <laughs> Mic drop. So, <clears throat> Mic drop. So, uh, good, good on you, Stephen Richer. And with that, I want to thank our special guest, David French, and our regular panel, and also Kathy Young, for sitting in. And our producer, Jim Swift, our sound engineer, Jonathan Siri, and all of our listeners and now viewers on YouTube. And Beg to Differ will return next week as every week. <laughs>